Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for um, being here and then preparing this conference. Um, my name is Haishin Yoon. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in rhetoric. So um, I'm very glad to be here presenting um, this paper. Uh, the title is In Loving Memory of Biopolitics of Rendering Clones, Wounds, and Meat in Transnational Companion Dog Cloning. In 2009, BioArts International, a Northern California-based bi biotech company that offered the world's first commercial companion dog cloning service, announced that it had completed delivery of healthy cloned dogs to all five of its clients from its pil pilot dog, 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 dog cloning program called Best Friends Again program, but would discontinue cloning service as a result of several problems. Their dog cloning service had been performed in partnership with Suwon Biotech Research Foundation, based in Korea, and led by Dr. Woo Seok Hwang, a scientist disgraced for ethics violation in acquisition of human eggs and fabricating data for his human stem cell cloning research. Liu Hothorn, the CEO of BioArts, in the statement on their website, explained that they were stopping this service because of unethical black market competition with RNL, another South Korean company that had also announced a dog cloning service and hinted at the possibility of dumping the price. Making several more or less relevant accusations against Korean culture, Hawthorne warned that for every dog cloned by RNL in the future, it is likely that a thousand or more dogs who served as surrogates will be returned to dog farms and then eventually slaughtered for food as a direct result. While BioArt is out, out of picture, South Korea, a wannabe international powerhouse of biotechnology, has emerged as, a, as the hub of the commercial companion animal cloning service, largely for bereaved pet owners in the US. For example, Suwon Biotech Research Foundation, now independent from BioArts and currently the most active in the industry, has reproduced about 400 clones, including companion dogs and special service dogs, in the last four, uh, four or five years. My research examines what transnational pet cloning tells us about the, the effect, both in ethical and aesthetic sense, of mourning in the time of genetic reproduction. How do we make sense of this new method of carrying the loving memories of a beloved dog alive when the memories of the dead dog are mediated by <coughs> other living bodies, apparently clones, and other less visible bodies involved in the process? However, I'm not interested in evoking apocalyptic visions of clones as symptomatic of the loss of our ability to deal with death to mourn as a result and to mourn as a result of technological intervention. Such visions, prevailing both in pop cultural movies as well as philosophical critics, are often complicit with the anxious normativization of the proper human subject to whom identity, consciousness, and memory should be bound, and whose boundary is fantastically threatened by genetic reproducibility. Setting aside such nostalgic anxiety, I would like to reframe the question, borrowing Rosie Bridotti's new materialist and affirmative pers perspective. This question is, the question is, how do we carry memories of others through their fragmented and embodied inhibition within us? From this perspective, the technology of cloning, which displaces memories to the outside of the unitary subject eye, by diffusing them into other bodies. Help us to refigure the porous boundaries between memories and bodies, between self and others, and thereby allow us, allows us to see the act of remembrance as a prosthetic process involving embodied others. By the figure of prosthetics, I would like to mobilize the double connota connotations of the term, the substitution of artificial body parts for missing parts, and thus and at the same time, the conjuration of the missing part. 
From this approach, the research I'm working on interposes two questions. First, how does one compose memories of the beloved pet through interaction with its qualities? Second, what does cloning suggest about the effective value of life when it reproduces memorable bodies by rendering other bodies disposable and forgettable? What about the surrogate dogs who are sent back to dog farms after use? The egg donor dogs who go through surgeries and the sibling clones born with defects were born still. Today, I would like to focus on this second question, the question of suffering and death of other bodies and the forgetting of them as the prosthesis of memories. What I, am, what I am presenting here is not going to be an exhaustive analysis, but I offer a couple of fragments to open up a space to think about this forgetting of certain bodies as the prosthetics of memories for other bodies. At the intersection of differences of sex, species, abnormality, and cultural and economic value in the transnational context. In many visual representations, <coughs> a clone appears in its colony referring its reproducibility or with so-called original dog, or so-called the donor dog, the donor of the somatic cell containing DNA, not the donor of the un unfertilized eggs. What is left invisible in such portrayal of cloning as an asexual reproduction is the surrogate mother dogs and the egg donor dogs, as well as their siblings with defects and born still. For example, in the case of Sua, five surrogate mother dogs per, per order are used and each surrogate is implanted with about 10 embryos. Likewise, in the current stage of technology for cloning by somatic cell, uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer, and particularly where dog cloning is concerned, the most wet and messy part of the process involve female reproductive organs and body parts. In this sense, rendering clones involves drawing kinship between certain bodies, and untangling kinship with other bodies. And this untangling involves female reproductive bodies, not to conflate female dogs and female humans, but the feminist discourses on reproduction offers us useful tools to examine the implication of the sex animal bodies in dog cloning and vice versa. And the next point, the meaning of mourning a pet becomes more complicated when it comes to the suspicion that the surrogate mother dogs are returned to the dog farm where they, are, they might be slaughtered for dog meat. I say suspicion because I haven't found so-called evidence that the dogs used for pet cloning have been actually slaughtered for human consumption <coughs> yet. Not yet. This suspicion was first spoken out by Lou Horther, the CEO of Bi uh, BioArt International, <coughs> whose argument seems to be based on his conjecture that RNA Bio's plan to dump the price as low as $30 thousand dollars is impossible without compromising the most expensive process of the cloning, animal welfare. Very plausible suspicion, but not yet proven. Even though critics of pet cloning in Korea haven't proved that, that these dogs are consumed for meat, they have convincingly pointed out that South Korea's competence in dog cloning owes much to the dog farms that raise dogs for meat. They are not only easy sources for acquiring eggs and wombs of dogs, but also indicate and enact the low ethical standards for the treatment of dogs. When asked upon my visit to their facility in Suam, Dr. Huang, representing Suam, told me that the dogs are borrowed from a couple of so-called special breeders and returned to them after they are recovered from the process. Another scientist acknowledged that these breeders are those who run the dog farms for meat. But he, want, he said he wants to believe that the surrogate mother dogs are treated separately and would not end up as meat. Even though there are plenty of intimations, things are still opaque. However, before taking this opaqueness as something to clear up, I would like to take advantage of this opaqueness as a space to bring in another set of questions in order to imagine more historically and geographically situated I'm not bringing up cultural relativism 
as a frame to discuss eating dogs after their wombs are used. Criticisms so far by those who identify themselves as Western that not only equate Korea's dog eating culture with a lower standard of ethics, but also make this link by ev evoking the effect of shock and shame remind me of something familiar. What Gayatri Spivak has formulated as white men saving brown women from brown men now repeats in another form. White people saving yellow dogs, nurongi, in Korean, the most popular dog breed for meat in Korea from yellow people. By evoking the shocking savageness of dog eating, their languages of ethics echoes post-colonial inscription. On the other hand, the discourses on dog meat are so invested with historical and social meanings that it is virtually impossible to discuss ethics regarding dogs without slipping into the question of post-colonial history, nationalist de developmentalism, class and gender, so on and so forth. Thinking through dog cloning as a way of mourning, bodies are not, much, not so much storages for memories, including genetic data, as affective and prophetic interfaces, where collective memories are composed through encounters with other bodies, humans, animals, and technologies. And I would like to call for another biopolitics of memory that is ontologically entangled with other bodies, as well as other kinds of ethics, and effects across the uneven and often hierarchical differences. Thank you.